thank you very much, everyone. It's a real pleasure to be here, and it's great to be in a room full of so many people from so many different places. So uh, thanks for having us. Um, as many of you are probably aware, last month Donald Trump announced that the NAFTA negotiations were going to be renegotiated. Uh, that's a process that will kick off um, within the next probably month or two. Uh, we also heard this week, if you're not aware, that the U.S. and Mexico uh, renegotiated the uh, sugar trade deal between the two countries, which is a bit of a early look, I guess, at how some of the NAFTA negotiations uh, might start to play out. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about trade, more between Canada and Mexico. Um, that's the expertise that we have here on the panel today. Um, but the spirit of NAFTA uh, kind of revolves around uh, the trade between the two countries, of course. Um, and uh, we'll get a little bit of a flavor of how we think some of the negotiations around NAFTA will, will sort of play out on the ground uh, between our two countries. So um, maybe let's start with you, Natalie, by talking about some of the challenges, maybe one challenge and one opportunity that you think is going to arise through this negotiation process. Thank you. Thanks, John. And thank you to the organizers for, uh, for inviting us here today, and in particular, it's a great opportunity. I didn't think we were going to start on NAFTA, so I, we did, we did uh, get the questions in advance. But um, it's, it's certainly a very interesting time for three countries and in the context of NAFTA. Um, so in terms of uh, opportunity and challenges that may, that may follow as we perhaps look at, um, at the agreement, um, certainly from the federal government's perspective, it's an opportunity to modernize the North American Free Trade Agreement. And, um, you know, the agreement's been in place now for well over 20 years. Um, so it could, be, it could be a really great opportunity to introduce um, new elements uh, around progressive trade, um, fair and open trade and investment practices. So certainly um, we'll, uh, we'll continue to be optimistic and, uh, and opportunistic. Um, you may or may not have known, seen or, or be aware that uh, the Minister of Foreign Affairs, Christian Freeland, who is leading on this process from the Canadian side, has recently launched consultations within Canada. Um, so that will inform um, the discussions going forward. So, so certainly there's an openness to hearing from Canadians uh, and, and consulting within the country to find out you know, some, some areas of interest and those consultations are meant to guide um, the federal government's position as it engages with Canada, pardon with U.S. and Mexico. In terms of challenges, um, I'm not sure I'm authorized to get into all of them, but uh, I think I think it's fair to say that with any trade negotiations, you, you can expect some difficulties. You know, people come to the table, negotiators come to the table looking for the best deal for their respective countries and their respective nationals. So um, I, I think any set of negotiations, if you've ever negotiated a business deal, you know, if you've ever negotiated your mortgage, you know, you understand these things. You come forward with what you want to be the best deal and the other party does the same. So there's always a little bit of a space in there. What do you concede and what do you, where do you have that, that area where you can so it's no different in a set of trade talks. Um, but certainly, you know, I, I would just conclude by saying that um, uh, the Canadian government is very committed to the NAFTA partnership. It's very committed to um, our other two partners, to Mexico and U.S. in this process. And uh, we would look forward to having the best possible deal for Canadians. And so, uh, Rodrigo, I, I know there's only certain things you can talk about around the NAFTA negotiation, but maybe the, the question for you is more around kind of a, a challenge and an opportunity over the next year or two for, you know, sort of relations, generally speaking, uh, between Canada and Mexico on the business perspective. Well, of course, uh, and, and I, uh, as we talked before the green room, uh, is my, my perspective on, on the whole NAFTA renegotiation is, of course, there's challenges with Nan talked about it as, as in any negotiation, but I, I think the, the opportunities lie in where we have not approached to understand what are other, again, opportunities amongst our region. You know? 
we've, uh, of course, engaged in different sectors. Uh, we've engaged in the mining sector, we've engaged in agricultural and energy, which is actually a very key opportunity for the new uh, face of that, uh, energy. But, uh, and we're in the room filled with entrepreneurs. Uh, definitely the engagement between NAFTA and how NAFTA companies engage with other communities around the world. And we have a very uh, clear participation of Latin American startups. Uh, that is definitely a, a, a great opportunity. There is, uh, are great things happening uh, between our countries already. And, and I'm, I'm sorry uh, to put on the spot uh, our dear friend Julie from Scotiabank, which is basically they are a NAFTA global company. But actually, Scotiabank has a, a, great, a great presence in Mexico. And it's a presence not only because of financial business, but as well as in, innovator in fields of fintech. Which is something that we uh, are, are wanting to approach uh, in, in a more close way uh, already with the Scotia Bank. But it's, it's quite unique because the head of the whole effort, he's a Mexican gentleman who lives here in Canada and is working for the purpose of bringing Scotia Bank into the new uh, uh, economy based on technologies around fintech. No? So, definitely, I, I think that's, that's an opportunity. I think a challenge is is, 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 is basically trying to uh, clear our current mindsets of what are or have been the traditional engagements that we've had. Definitely, and, and we talk about this uh, based on, I'm going to talk about the investment numbers. Uh, we've been, I'm going to quote a bit of, of your information, not too much, but uh, uh, Mandy mentioned in that the relationship of investment relates to around 20 billion US dollars. And, and as a Mexican position, this is our challenge. During the 10 year period, Mexico, out of those 20 billion, has invested around 2 billion in Canada, which is only 10% of the whole engagement. You know? But in the same period, Mexico has invested 40 billion dollars in the United States. So, challenge for us is, and, and I think we're breaking that challenge right now, because our Mexican entrepreneurs and businessmen are engaging more in, um, in reviewing and understanding what can Canada bring to them as an opportunity to be in NAFTA, to approach NAFTA businesses and global businesses from Canada. So, that is definitely a challenge. It's a great challenge to have. And definitely plays a, a very important role right now in what's uh, underlying the NAFTA negotiations is how can we be competitive as a global region, not between our countries, but to the rest of the world. And I'm sorry, I didn't see uh, uh, our, our, our friend also from, from Joseph, right? But I saw Julie and Joseph, so I just want to add Joseph as well, who's also Colombian. Sorry. No, 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 that's great. Well, and actually, Joseph had mentioned to me that there are five uh, Scotia innovation labs. One of them is in Toronto, the other four, if I'm not mistaken, are in Latin America. <laughs> so the, the presence for their labs as a Canadian company is greater in Latin America than it is here, which is very interesting. And I also hadn't realized how uh, involved Mexico is generally in the fintech sort of ecosystem itself. So that's also interesting. Uh, it's a great synergy between. So, now, do you, do you think there's anything more about the sort of bilateral relationship between our two countries that we want to highlight, maybe from a policy perspective or from a general perspective? Yeah, yeah no, it's, it's a very rich uh, bilateral relationship. I mean, we, we often, when we talk about Canada and Mexico in recent years, it's always been through the light of the NAFTA relationship. But I think when we, when we put the light more on just Canada and Mexico, um, it really does tell a great story. I mean, if you want to talk about figures and data, and it's $40 billion a year in bilateral trade. So that's, you know, our companies doing business with each other. We talked about the investment piece, which could certainly grow. Um, 
our companies have been making things together and doing business together. And certainly, we've talked about the financial services sector. We've talked about the Scotia Bank. There are, um, you know, all of Canada's big corporations have some form of presence in Mexico. Um, Mexico is a real driver. It's a, it's a really big part of the automotive, uh, the regional automotive sector and the value chain and. Uh, we each bring different pieces um, to that, but certainly Mexico has, has a huge, has a big motor, has a big motor um, within that equation, and we have quite a few companies in that value chain, and the U.S. is a piece of it as well. But in terms of, um, of where that relationship comes from, we've enjoyed a very strong, you know, diplomatic terms. Canada and Mexico have, uh, have been partnering for over 17 years and have been recognizing each other uh, on their own merits for that period of time. Um, there's some great initiatives that are underway. Um, you know, again, Mr. Freeland in the context of uh, initiatives around women and business women. There will be, um, uh, there, there was an MOU signed, in fact, amongst all three ministers of foreign affairs to encourage more initiatives by business women. And I think the next event is going to be in Mexico in November of this year. So, you know, as Rodrigo was saying, you know, in addition to the traditional relationship that has taken shape, you know, in areas such as um, the agriculture sector, the mining sector, forestry sector, um, manufacturing sector, what we would like to see as policymakers, and I'll say from a Canadian perspective, the Canadian government is very much committed to helping our startups and our innovators and our researchers to do more with their Mexican counterparts. And we, we're seeing a little bit of that coming up. Um, you know, when you talk about the Canada-Mexico relationship as well, Canada knows Mexico very well for its beautiful beaches and its escape in the winter. We have two million Canadians who go to Mexico every year. We don't have as many Mexicans coming to Canada. I think it's more in the order of 300,000. Um, so, you know, with any two countries, what we've seen with Canada and Mexico is that we've invested in Mexico, we see the great trade relationship, we love to go to Mexico to visit, but we see a piece of it. And there's so much more to that relationship that can be developed. And, um, and Rodrigo, if, you know, you, I'd love for you to talk a little bit about the investments. But of those $2 billion investments, there's some really interesting and, and successes, great successes that I think we need to shine the light on in terms of technology and to see more of that. But I think the story is evolving. I think it's, it's uh, I think the traditional sectors will always be there, but I think we want to put the focus on great innovative new technologies, mobile apps that can be introduced, and they are being introduced um, into the Mexican um, restaurant and food services industry, to the transportation sector, to the wireless security. We talked a little bit about fintech. Um, we're trying to grow more in terms of people-to-people -people ties and uh, researchers to researchers. We would love to recruit more students from Mexico to Canada, and I think there's a lot of good movement happening there. I think on, on labor mobility, allowing our people to, to come and study um, and to work in each other's countries, I think there's been a lot of progress made on that front. And I think there are a lot of great policies, and I don't want to get too far into that because I think we might have a chance to, to speak to that. But um, maybe I'll, I'll stop there and I'll let Rodrigo maybe add anything. Well, Rodrigo, I think maybe from your perspective, you could talk a little bit about what is being done to support startups in Mexico, um, whether it be there or whether it be you know startups that are also going to be doing some work up here. Because I think from the innovation perspective, it's really the startups that are driving that, and they're such an important part of both of our economy. Well, actually, we're in luck because uh, right in front of ourselves, uh, me, of the two of us, we have Zed and we have Leanne, who are number one at the very point, very important point in Mexico, because they handle the entrepreneur development through the nurture. So, so we'll be talking later to Leanne, and she's the entrepreneur uh, uh, capital director, and she's the director general. And uh, saying that, uh, we have them here in Canada, uh, saying that they are responsible as well, as well for the engagement for the trilateral agreement for promoting women into business and other fields. And so
saying that, uh, they're bringing today a project called Innovation Bridge, which hopefully we'll be able to establish uh, in communities around Canada to start exchanging startups between uh, Mexico and Canada in a, in a greater fashion. Um, uh, Duffy Eden, which is the National Institute of Entrepreneurial Development, which sits on the ex expanded cabinet of, of the executive power, has been one of the pillars of what is driving Mexico's future. So entrepreneurial work is definitely a priority for our government. I'm not going to talk too much about this because that's the sales panel. But uh, this is uh, this strategy, this effort is allowing us uh, to take the best of what Mexico can offer in innovation, technology fields, and other ones, to take them to the world. Definitely, Canada is a great location for this to happen. We weren't able to talk in our green room about the technology trends, and I'm not going to talk about it right now. But in Canada, in this area of Canada alone, sits in a very simple one for the future of industries. We're talking about internet of things, we're talking about integration of digital to biological, we're talking about uh, we're talking about uh, uh, self-driving cars, we're talking about different things. Because what well, that is being done is community. Mexico understands that, our companies understand that, that's what we're trying to do. For me to fathom the reason of, and I'm going to mention this, and now it's public, we have a Mexican military contractor working on transportation systems, opening an up shop for water to put up and set up in our industry. That for me is tremendous. And that is only one technology that we're bringing to this location. And why? This is not because Canada is the Canadians are not nice. We'll see that. Yeah. This is not because of maple syrup. This is not because of the team. This is because this is this is where there's stability in the world for this to happen. And this is where everybody else, the Americans, are crossing up talent by developing, and Canadians and, and, and Americans in other countries. So we definitely foresee a great potential in increasing these capabilities. We have them to support uh, the, the uh, we have a big work for it. International, internationalization of startups to the world from Mexico. And uh, we're all of our agencies, our foreign affairs, our economic uh, agency, our national science council, go back in their efforts. So uh, we, 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 I, I think not only can we have a great personal relationships with government officials like Christopher and, and our minister have a very tight relationship, but there are so many reasons behind of working together to strengthen relationships and land on concrete missions. So we only see a great future for both our countries. And of course, the US is important, but now I'm going to quote, uh, uh, I don't know the cruise, it's back to the I wasn't expecting that. OK, good. Uh, so Natalie, I think that gives us a nice segue into how Canada is accelerating our technology and our, our tech companies abroad, whether it's either Mexico or elsewhere. Absolutely. And I have to acknowledge uh, Rodrigo's great words. It's, it's always good to have a testimonial. Government shouldn't sound great. It's on country here. It should come from others. So I have to thank Rodrigo for that great testimonial about what's happening here and the stability and the, you know, the emergence of, of these super clusters and, um, and great technologies that are being made and, and developed here in Canada. And I could show some leadership. Um, and that we are a gateway. You know, I mean, we talked a little bit about the NAFTA agreement, but when you add that to the new agreement that Canada signed with Europe, with the European Union, I mean, that gives any company who establishes themselves here access to close to a billion consumers, and they are very wealthy, affluent consumers. So it is that Canada has this really unique position as a very sophisticated, <laughs> and safe, and predictable gateway. So, Rodrigo, thank you. I'll invite you to speak with me more often. But on innovation startups, um, the federal government has been quite active, I'd like to say, um, not only since the last budget release of March of this year, but even in the fall, 
is across many ministries that have a mandate, whether it's immigration policy, whether it's funding for startups, whether it's innovation policy. I know our keynote earlier uh, spoke eloquently about the lack of a Canadian innovation policy, and I won't necessarily disagree with that statement, but I would like to say that there, there are a lot of um, efforts underway, and I'll name a few of them uh, specifically. So there's the um, uh, Global Skills Agenda, which is essentially the innovation agenda, and uh, $1.2 billion was announced in the recent federal budget, and it will include concrete initiatives to support Canadian startups that are working in, in really exciting, cool new areas of technology, whether it's Internet of Things, artificial intelligence, clean tech, autonomous vehicles, information technologies. So there will be some new ways available, I think, we're um, there's also on the immigration front quickly a startup visa was launched in March of this year and that will pave the way for any technology based innovators wanting to come and work here, establish a business to gain permanent residence. And I think it's unique in the world. Um, I, I think we're getting close to our time, but um, there's a lot of work happening. The Canadian government has accelerators and incubators in different parts of the world to help Canadian startups and innovators. So there's a, there's a bunch of examples that exist and want to keep growing those and building on them to support our great startups. Right. And in partnership with great places.